Before we begin the sermon this morning, I'd like to start with a prayer and petition found in our uh, Lesser Feasts and Fasts. It's our church's colic for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Almighty God, grant that your church, following the example of your prophet, Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love and may strive to secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And you may be seated as you're able this morning. Well, as we celebrate the birth and life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King this weekend, it's not lost on me that there are probably far better and far qualified prophets and voices than mine to illuminate his great accomplishments. The accomplishments of a man who no doubt has left the greatest legacy of justice in our nation's history. Perhaps it's more suitable for someone who marched beside him or who has carried his vision for a lifetime. And yet by the spirit or by chance, I'm your preacher today. A lot of it by chance, I'll tell you that much. One of those children of the future that the Reverend Dr. King had so much hope for and dreamed of. And it is that hope and that dream that comes in the fullness of time that was so crucial to sustaining the Reverend Dr. King's ministry to the world and also a hope that sustains the life of the church today. A quote used on several occasions by the Reverend Dr. King and also beloved by the former president Barack Obama was that that arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. More fully, he once wrote, evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross. But that same Christ arose and split history into AD and BC so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. Yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice, he said. What does it mean for us in the church that that long arc of history, the moral universe, bends towards justice? In Christian theology, this lens of viewing the direction of our shared future together and a belief that it bends towards union and fullness and hope found in people who anticipate and experience the coming of the Lord. And while it is an anticipation found in other faiths, it is uniquely Christian. It is a uniquely Christian theology, the anticipation of the coming of the Messiah is encapsulated in a theological term, parousia. Parousia, the time of the arrival of the Messiah. Parousia, I was always taught, is an overlapping of time between what was and what is promised. In the context of Christ, we know perfection. We have seen God made flesh as we celebrate in the incarnation and in this season of epiphany, the witnessing of God made flesh, God in the world. And yet God's fullness has not been completely expressed in the world today. Theologians sometimes paraphrase parousia, this theological truth, with the phrase, already, but not yet. In Christ, we know peace, but we have not seen peace manifest through the, throughout the entire world. In Christ, we know justice, 
but we have not seen freedom fully manifest in our own cities, let alone in the world. In Christ, we have seen perfect love, and yet we struggle to love perfectly. Christ's perfection is already around us, but not yet fully manifest around us. We wait for Christ's coming in glory, but we do not wait passively. The anticipation of Christ's coming again in fullness to perfect our communities, to make rough places smooth, is an act we are called to participate in. In fact, it may be that it is our combined efforts, the church in her capacity to be the body of Christ, that this fullness of peace and justice is intended to come about. Us, we, the body of Christ. In our gospel today, we hear the story of the first miracle in Cana of Galilee. And anyone who's been married in the Episcopal faith has probably heard the reference we took our vows to. It wasn't so long for me, only about four years ago, to hear this great and significant wedding in Cana, Christ's presence and first miracle in the context of a wedding, a joyful wedding, a marriage, and also a union in the theological, spiritual context of our community. The joyful union of marriage is meant to be a vision to us all of the joyful union we are meant to have with God and with each other. That is what makes it a sacrament, that it is a visible sign of God's immeasurable love for us. In Paul's letter to the people of Corinth this morning, we hear a challenge for us to consider the gifts that each and every one of us may possess. Unique gifts, unique to us, that each one of us may possess for the building up of God's kingdom. Teachers, prophets, preachers, truth tellers, justice workers. This 12th chapter falls just before the notable and probably most memorable passage in Corinthians in the 13th chapter. Love is kind, love is patient. Love is not envious or boastful or rude. And it continues, for we know only in part and we prophesy only in part. But when that complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. Paul wrote to that little church in Corinth. The Reverend Dr. King held great hope and shared his dream for the children and the generations to come, to follow. God has placed God's hope and dreams also on God's children. And God has given us the tools of hope and faith and love and healing, the working of miracles to actively build up God's kingdom in the world around us. Today, in that voice of Paul, we might consider and wonder, what tool are we called to pick up to make Christ known? 
What tool are we called to pick up to make that dream a bit more of a reality? What gift has been given to bring healing to the community around us? So this week, as we pick up these tools and use our gifts for the mission and hope of faith, let us pray. God, wherever you have called us, whatever our gifts may be, guide us, your children, in the building up of your kingdom and in the fulfilling of dreams. Nurture us as we grow into the fullness of Christ. Wake up this world that your dreams and the dreams of your prophets may come true. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.